I want to bring you a message on prayer. Prayer. You say, what's that got to do with salvation? Well, it's got a whole lot to do with salvation. That's where salvation begins. You can't, if you can get a fellow to pray and ask Christ to save him, then, then God will save him. Luke chapter 18, verse 1. And he, Jesus, spake a parable unto them to this end. In other words, it was to bring about something. That men ought always to pray and not to faint. Saying, there was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city. And she came unto him saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. And shall not God avenge his own elect? I mean, if the judge was unjust, and yet he answered because of a continual coming, shall not your heavenly Father answer if you continually come? And he is just. I mean, if the unjust will do it, don't worry about God. He'll do it also, folks. If there's something that, that you need as a Christian or an unsaved person needs in the way of salvation, you and I we've got to get in the habit of continually coming to God over that thing until God answers. The problem with us is we faint rather than continue. He said, men ought always to pray and not to faint. Then he says, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. I wonder. Our faith is so small anymore that we don't spend much time on our knees. We spend too much time running and doing instead of going into prayer and asking God to do some things for us. Folks, the business of salvation is God's business. The Holy Spirit, when he has come, he'll do the convicting. He'll do the reproving. See? The Bible says that salvation is of the Lord. Sal conviction is of the Lord. Salvation is of the Lord. I tell you, folks, it's, it's one thing to bring men to God. It's something else to get God to men. We've got to, we've got to pray that God will open the doors for us to talk to people and encourage people and finally break down that resistance and that, uh, that pride and that will, that resistant will in their lives so that they will come and hear the gospel. We go knock on the doors and say, will you come to church? And they say, no. Say, well, okay, go to hell then. We've gone down the way. And folks, he said because of her continual coming, he answered her. And he said, how much more will God who's just answer his own elect? And you are the elect if you're saved. If you're saved, you're in Jesus Christ and he is in the elect. Folks, if your neighbors, if your loved ones, if your relatives, if your friends are going to be saved, you're not going to have to just put down one prayer a week or one prayer a month. But he said night and day. Night and day. Kim and Jennifer, the only way your dad's going to be saved is you're going to have to pray continually. And if you give up, he will not. He will not. You have to pray that God will do that. Others of you that have asked prayer for, I just happen to think of that one, but others of you that have asked prayer, I'll tell you, folks, it's going to have to come that way. It's going to have to come that way. Brother Ralph, the only way Alma is going to be saved is if you continue to pray. I don't know what happened to him. He was over here. He's around here somewhere. The only way that Alma Parsons is going to be saved, the only way Jim Hiles is going to be saved, is not to faint. I know now there's times when you feel like fainting. You feel like you're just throwing up your hand and say, well, I just don't know what else to do. Well, just keep praying. Just keep going to the judge of the whole earth. And he will avenge. He will avenge. Men ought always to pray. Praying is asking. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled unto God. Prayer is merely asking. You know, <clears throat> do you suppose that the reason we don't ask God more often, you suppose the reason we don't ask God as often as we should is simply because we're just too proud to ask. I wonder if that doesn't keep us from a real close fellowship in prayer with God. 
Only by pride cometh contention. He that exalts himself shall be abased, but he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. He says in James, he said, draw nigh unto God, and he'll draw nigh unto thee. I think many times the problem with our prayer life is pride. The problem with our prayer life is pride. We're just too proud to ask. To ask. That's what prayer is. Did you know that prayer is one of the most common things to all the beliefs and all the faiths in the world, no matter if they're right or wrong? There's a lot of things that we, we don't have in common with a Buddhist or a Hindu, but I'll tell you what prayer is. They pray. That's a common thing. The most common thing in the world amongst all people. It's, so, it's, it's unbelievable how it's so little practiced by those who really have the ability to pray. The Bible says that we can come boldly before the throne of God to find grace. Folks, you and I have, the way is open to us. The veil is rent. The blood has been applied. You have the unction of the Holy Spirit. You have the right to walk into the throne room and ask God anything according to his will, and he will do it. That's what he said. He said, Jesus Christ said in John chapter 14, John chapter 16, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. And why isn't things getting done? Why aren't things getting done? I don't think we ask like we ought to. I just don't think we ask like we ought to. Prayer is common to all beliefs. You go back there to 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 26, you'll find uh, the, uh, the religious people back there that worship Baal. They were, uh, they, were, they were praying. Notice back there in 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 26. The heathen pray. I'm not saying that God hears them. I'm just saying they pray. <clears throat> I'm saying, you know, wouldn't it be a shame we get to the judgment... We get to the judgment and find out some heathen spent more time in prayer than we ever did. And he was praying to some monkey god or some snake god or some uh, metal god or bronze god or gold god that would never answer. And here we have a god that has all power, all knowledge. Uh, he's omnipresent and he'll do those things and yet we don't. First Kings chapter 18. And Elijah, verse 25, said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose ye one bullock for yourselves, and dress it first, for ye are many, and call on the name of your gods, uh, but put no fire under. And they took the bullock which was given them, and they dressed it and called, the name, called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice. They're praying. I mean, they spent the whole morning in prayer. When was the last time you can remember spending a morning or an afternoon or an evening in prayer? You know, that's why Jesus said sometimes to the nation of Israel, he said, uh, the Gentiles are going to rise up in judgment against this generation. He said, you have the things of the kingdom. You have the word of God. You have the prophets of God. You have all those things, and you don't do right, and yet look at the heathen, what they do. What they do. I'll never forget a story I read about a missionary in a foreign land who saw a woman with two young children walking down to a sacred river. might have been the Ganges. I don't know, one of those sacred rivers over there in the Orient, in the east, the far east. And she was carrying one, and this baby was deformed. And the other baby was walking alongside her. The other little small child was walking alongside her. And she walked down to that river. She laid that baby down that had a deformity down on the ground and picked that other child up and walked out into that river and submerged that baby in the river and drowned it right there. And that missionary was horrified. And he went to that woman and and beseeched her and asked her, why did you do that? Why did you kill that boy? Why did you kill that baby? And that woman said, well, we believe that this river is holy. We believe that our gods are connected with this river and that we are to appease our gods and to show our God how much that we love him. So we sacrifice what we have to our gods. And the missionary said, for crying out loud, why didn't you, if you were going to kill one of them, why didn't you give the one that was deformed? And she said, well, mister, we give only our God the best. We give only our gods the best. You know, one of these days we stand in the judgment seat of Christ, and we stand in the judgment, and we see that woman. Yes, she may be unsaved. She may be on her way to hell. 
but I wish I had her kind of dedication. I wish I had her kind of devotion to give God the best. Listen, folks, prayer is common to every belief, even an atheist. Well, I tell you what, if, I tell you what, sometimes things will happen to him. Some, somebody will hurt him or he'll be in an accident, be in a wreck, and before he thinks it, he'll begin to pray. Oh, God! I mean, before he's thought and remembered that he's an atheist, he'll holler it out. That's common to everybody on this world is to pray, to pray. And men ought always to pray. That's the thing that distinguishes man from animals. I don't care how bad a dog gets. I don't care how bad he, how thin he gets. I don't care how bad, how hungry he gets. He'll never lift up his head and pray. Brother, he'll tear garbage cans apart and sacks apart. He'll rip and roar down through the neighborhood, but he'll never pray. If there's one thing that distinguishes man from other animals, it's that man has the ability to lift his head and his heart toward God and his empty hands and say, God, help me. Animals never do. You're not, you're not in the evolutionary uh, link. Animals never pray. Never have, never will. Man, God's put it within man's bosom to cry out to God, and man does when trouble comes. Man does when trouble comes. Men ought always to pray. I want to show you some prayers in the Bible I think will be a blessing to you. Turn, first of all, to Luke chapter 23. And in Luke chapter 23, look at a prayer of salvation. A prayer of salvation. I believe this most important prayer in the world is when a man gets saved. I believe it's the most important thing in the world. Man gets saved. <clears throat> I wish we would get everybody that makes a profession in church. I wish we'd get everybody that trusts Christ to get baptized and start church, but we don't always do that. Brother Rick Sowell was telling me the other night that they had about 99 or 100 conversions last year in his church, and he said only 35 of them were in church. I about fell off the chair, brother. 35% of them are coming to church. What? A, that's tremendous. That's tremendous. And yet he was saying, well, we need to set up a follow-up ministry and try to reach the other. I said, praise God, man. I mean, go out and get them, my brother. Thank God for the 35. We've had, we've had as many as 500 saved here in a year and not seen 35 come. It's, it's, it's one thing to get folks to pray. It's something else to get them in church. Something else to get them in church. But I want you to know a prayer of sal uh, see a prayer of salvation. Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23, verse 39. And one of the malefactors, which were hanged, railed on him. Now, this is the crucifixion with the two thieves, one on each side of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they uh, hanged, uh, railed on him and said, If thou be Christ, save thyself. But the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not fear God, seeing that thou art in the same condemnation? We indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. When Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. I want you to see here the prayer of salvation. The prayer of salvation. It includes two things. It includes, first of all, the confession of sin. The confession of sin. Folks, I believe this is the first prayer that God hears from the lips of an individual on this earth. The first thing God hears from any individual on this earth is, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, because we're all sinners. We're all sinners. The very first thing is a confession of sin. That's the issue. Sin is the issue. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I don't care how good you think your neighbors might be or uh, maybe you've got a school teacher or an aunt or an uncle or a grandmother, grandpa, and you just don't think they can do anything wrong and maybe in your sight and your, and your standard, they are almost perfect. But let me tell you something. In God's eyes, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Old Isaiah said back there in Isaiah 64, 6, all we as an unclean thing. We're all as an unclean thing. We've all gone out of the way, and he's laid on him the iniquity of us all in Isaiah 53. He said, all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. That's the issue. The issue between God and man is not money. The issue between God and man is not a health or wealth. The issue between God and man is sin. He said, the soul that sinneth it shall die. That's what God's interested in. He's interested in the law being broken and somebody making a payment for it. God's not interested in whether you get a new car or a new house or that sort of thing. 
If you're unsaved, the only thing God wants to hear out of your lips is, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. The confession of sin. Some religious leaders here recently made, this, made some statements about the Jews and other people that God doesn't hear their prayers. Oh, folks, I know this. I know God hears the prayer of forgiveness. I know God hears that prayer. The, the repentant publican said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And God heard it. Jesus Christ said, that man went away justified. Justified. The prayer of salvation must include a confession of sin. That's the answer. Now, notice here in Luke chapter 8, Luke chapter 23, this one thief says, Dost thou not fear God, seeing that thou art in the same condemnation? He said, you're being crucified just like this man. He said, you're suffering the same punishment he is. And we indeed justly. See that confession of sin? Let me tell you something, friend. You'll never have the right relationship with God, whether you're saved or lost, until you recognize your sin in your life. You'll never have... He said, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth from all sin. Until you learn how to confess sin, you'll never have a relationship or fellowship with God Almighty. Men ought always to pray. The first thing you ought to do when you get down to pray is, God, I'm a sinner. I did this wrong. I said this. I hurt so-and-so. I've done other things. I lusted after this. I wanted that. I looked on this thing and I shouldn't have done it. And I had the wrong motive there. Confess, confess, confess. Men are always to pray. I fear that some of us don't pray enough simply because we don't want to confess. Have you ever got down on your knees and said, oh, I, I, brother, I, I've tried this a couple times and, I, and it's scary. I've got down. And I, you want to find out whether there's a God or not? I'll show you how to do it. Get down on your knees. Close your eyes. You're all alone somewhere. Not much noise. Get away as much noise as you can. And then just say, God, what are my sins? I guarantee you, he'll tell you. Amen, sister. But you know, that's one reason why we stay off our knees. We don't want to be convicted. We don't want to be rebuked. Men ought always to pray. Folks, there's not going to be any fellowship or relationship to God until there is a confession of sin. The one, the one malefactor, he railed on Jesus Christ. The other one said, look, man, he said, you're just as guilty as anybody. And he said, he didn't do anything wrong. We're the ones that are wrong. Confession of sin. That's the issue. You know what Psalm, the writer of the psalm, psalm says, uh, psalmist said, God hates all the workers of iniquity. God doesn't hate politicians. God doesn't hate religious people. God doesn't hate uh, business people. God doesn't hate the laboring man. God hates the wicked. That's what he hates. That's the issue. That's the issue. Men ought always to pray. And our prayers ought to begin with, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Show me my sins. Listen, let him show you. Your sins will only blind you. Your sins will only hinder you from ever being what God wants you to be. Go there and show him and say, God, show me my sins. And then when he begins to show them, confess them. Confess them. He begins to say, well, there was pride there, envy there, lust there, fornication with the eyes, idolatry with the heart. And as he begins to list them in your life, confess them. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to do what? We, it, it's as if, it's as if we're afraid to get down and, and acknowledge them as if we, if we did, God would belt us in the head for doing it. No, if he's going to do that, he'd already did it because you've already sinned. And, and for, by the grace of God, he hadn't belted us in the head. Amen? Amen. Him, he hasn't really rewarded us according to our iniquities. He wants to forgive. He wants it under the blood of Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth from all sin. God wants you and I to be clean. That's the issue. Will we be clean or will we be dirty? The prayer of salvation has to include the confession of sin. Now notice also the concession of need. He conceded. He said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. 
the concession of need. There is a lot of people, there are a lot of people in this world who do confess their sins. And that's good. But folks, you got to go all the way with God. Not only today does God require the confession of sin, but there must be a concession of need of Jesus Christ. Paul said, testifying both to the Jews and to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith. There has to be a, a, a willingness to go all the way. Judas repented. Judas repented. He said, I've, he said, I've cursed or I've condemned the unjust one, uh, uh, condemned the, 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 the innocent blood. I can't remember exactly how I said it, but he repented of it. He repented of it. He confessed it. But the Bible said he went to hell in Acts chapter 1. Why? Judas went halfway. Is that your experience? If the only experience you got, that you have with God is just confessing sin, that's good. That's the first step. But that's only a start. What a shame to get that far and then miss going to heaven. I mean, Judas repented and went to hell. Have you gone all the way? Now, you read over there in Acts chapter 8, a man by the name of Simon, the sorcerer. You know what Simon did? Simon believed. He believed what was spoken about Jesus Christ. But when it came right down to it, Peter looked him square in the face. He said, keep your money. He said, you're in the gall of iniquity, in the bond of iniquity. He said, thy money perish with thee. He said, you are not right in the sight of God. Now, there was Simon. He'd gone halfway. He had believed, but he'd never repented. That's what's going on around America. You got one group getting everybody to confess their sins once or twice a year but they don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to save them. And another group going out and say, now all you have to do is believe on Jesus and you can go to heaven. All you got to do is, is accept Jesus into your life and you can go to heaven. No. That's just as satanic as the other thing. Folks, the prayer of salvation includes both things. A confession of sin and a concession of need. You must concede to God that you need Jesus Christ. He said, come unto me all ye that labor and heavy laden. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Folks, to miss that is to miss heaven. The rich young ruler came to Jesus Christ, and he said, good master, what good thing must I do to have eternal life? He wanted eternal life. He saw the need of eternal life. He knew that he didn't have it within his power, within his reach. He came to the one that could give it. And he came running. He came the right way. Then Jesus said, sell all you have and follow me. And it said that the young man went away <coughs> sorrowful. 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 He came the right way, but he didn't go all the way, did he? He was concerned. He was concerned, but he wasn't convinced. A lot of people come to preachers, they'll even come to you, and they'll say, well, what are the answers? And you give them to them and say, well, I don't want that answer. They're concerned, but they're not convinced that that's the way that they ought to go. There's only one way. There's a way which seems right unto a man. Let me tell you something, young people. There are a lot of ways in this life that look right, but the Bible says the ends there are the ways of death. Death, death. You better go the right way all the way easy to be deceived. The prayer of salvation includes the confession of sin and the concession of need. Turn now, if you will, to 1 Kings chapter 8. 1 Kings chapter 8. In 1 Kings chapter 8, you have a prayer of dedication. A prayer of dedication. I believe the greatest prayers in the Bible, number one, is the prayer of salvation. I believe once a person gets saved, then the next step are the prayers of dedication. I mean, if you're saved in here this morning, that's settled everything for eternity. But what about this life? What about the rest of your human life? What about the rest of your time here on this earth? What do you do next? Well, the next thing is to dedicate what you have to God. And in 1 Kings chapter 8, the Bible says in verse... 22, and this is after the house of the Lord has been finished. 
all the work was ended in chapter 7, verse 51. And then Solomon, uh, then the uh, Shekinah glory fills the house. Notice that the Shekinah glory comes in and fills the house. That's a picture of the Holy Spirit of God coming into the, bo the believer's body and saving the believer and anointing the believer. And then there's a sermon by Solomon. He preaches there in verses 12 through uh, 21. And then he begins the great prayer of dedication. I don't have time this morning, but I could show you some tremendous things in that prayer. You can match that prayer up with the so-called Lord's Prayer over there in the book of Matthew. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You'll find the same elements in this prayer all the way through it, almost identical to it. There are some tremendous things in this prayer. Notice in verse 46, the rebuke of this prayer. If they sin against thee, for there is no man that sinneth not. See that rebuke? In that prayer of dedication, O Solomon rebuked the people. He said, there is no, um, in verse 46, he said, for there is no man that sinneth not. There's a rebuke in the prayer of the dedication of the temple. Notice also in verse 47, there's repentance. Yet if they shall bethink themselves in the land whither they were carried captives and repent and make supplication unto thee in the land of them that carried them captives, saying, We have sinned and have done per perversely. We have committed wickedness. And so return unto thee, so forth and so on. In the prayer there is not only a rebuke, but there is repentance. The dedication of the temple prayer also includes restoration. Verse 48, And so return unto thee. The prayer of dedication of the temple included rest. Verse 56, Blessed be the Lord that hath given rest unto his people Israel. And last of all, it includes rejoicing, rejoicing. In verse 66, And on the eighth day he sent the people away, and they blessed the king and went under their tents joyful and glad of heart for all the goodness that the Lord had done for David his servant. Folks, I want to talk about now dedicating things, dedicating things. When you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes in and resides. There's been that prayer of confession and concession, and God saved the individual. Salvation is not because of church membership or baptism. It's because of an earnest, honest prayer to God for salvation. Then nextly, there needs to be a prayer of dedication. And here, Solomon is dedicating the temple. Well, there are some things that God wants us to dedicate. Now, de the demands of dedication are given in Exodus 28. Turn there, Exodus chapter 28. Before you can dedicate a thing, some things have to be true about it. Exodus 28, 41. And here, Moses is being told how to set up the Aaronic priesthood for the Lord's use. And thou shalt put them upon Aaron, the holy garments, thy brother and his sons with him. And thou shalt anoint them. The first thing that an individual needs in order to be dedicated is the anointing of the Holy Spirit. He needs the, 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 uh, the garments of righteousness, spoken of in verse 39 and 40. Then he needs the anointing, and then he needs to be consecrated. That means to, de to be devoted to God, and then sanctify them. That means to be cleansed and set apart. Those are the demands of dedication. After you get saved, you've been given the robes of righteousness. You have the priest garments now, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You have the, the, uh, uh, the ministry of the, uh, the, uh, the priesthood. Peter says we are a royal priesthood in 1 Peter 2, 9. He said, anoint them, consecrate them, and sanctify them. They're to be cleansed and set apart. Those are the demands of dedication. Now, what does God want us, you and I, to dedicate to him? Well, in this prayer, he talked about a rebuke. He talked about repentance, restoration, rest, and rejoicing. Those things are going to come to us. What are we going to have to do? Well, first of all, one thing God wants you and I to dedicate to him is our flesh. You know what he wants? He wants your body. He wants your body. Paul said, Brethren, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your what? Body. That's what he wants. He wants your vessel. He wants it to be filled with his Holy Spirit. 
He wants that vessel. Did you know many times you and I, we try to buy God off? Did you ever try to, did you ever try to uh, dicker with God and say, Lord, now I'll tithe, <clears throat> but I want this for myself and I want that time for myself and, and I just won't go all the way. People try to buy God off. That's good to tithe. I believe every Christian ought to tithe. I think, that's, I think that's, that's fine. That's good works for a Christian. But I don't think it ought to be used as conscious money. If he has your body, he'll have your tithe. But if he has your tithe and doesn't have your body, you're out of the will of God. Brethren, I beseech you by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice unto God. Holy, acceptable. See, it, there's demands on it. Not, that's just all. That's what God wants. God wants you first of all to get saved the, and pray the prayer of salvation. The next step is the prayer of dedication. Oh, Solomon was dedicating the temple. What back in the Old Testament, what God filled back there was the temple. In the New Testament, you are the temple of God. God wants you to dedicate your body to Him. And I tell you what, folks. Honestly, now. The Lord is never going to be satisfied with any of us, me included, Dave Jones, Jim White. God's not going to be satisfied with Billy Graham. God's not going to be satisfied with Peter Ruckman. God's not going to be satisfied with Ronald Reagan until everybody dedicates their body to him. That's what God wants. He wants a prayer of dedication where you just go to him, just as you went to him for salvation and said, God, I'm a sinner. I deserve to go to hell, but I want to be saved, and he saved you. He also wants you to dedicate that body, that flesh to him. That's your reasonable service. Some people try to buy him off with a little time. I say, Lord, I'll be there on Sunday. But now, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and that's mine. But I'll be there on Sunday, Lord. They try to dicker with God, try to bargain with God. Listen, if God's got your body, he's got you every day of the week. You'll be submitted to his will every day of the week. You'll worship him not, on, not only on Sunday, but every day of the week. Oh, I, I know, yes. You, you say, well, preacher, now I can worship the Lord on my... Yes, I know you can. But my Bible says not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. When this assembly meets, if you're a part of it, if you pray for it, you're to meet. Well, let me ask you something. Where are you going to meet? Where are you going to be when the assembly meets? You're going to miss that one? I mean, when God calls out the whole church, I wonder what would happen sometimes if he'd just let us have our own attitude. We'd have a split rapture then, brother. About half of us would stay. Well, God calls the church out here Wednesday night. God calls the church out for visitation. God calls the church out. We have special meetings. Where are you? Do you think it's wrong to ask folks to come? Listen, God said man shall not live by bread alone. Ye eat bread every day of the week. But by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God shall man live. America's going to hell simply because Americans aren't dedicated. They're not dedicated. They don't give a flip when it comes to living for God Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And you can get a bee in your bonnet. I'm not mad at you. I love you very much. Listen, if I didn't love you, I wouldn't say anything. I'd say, just go right ahead. You're doing fine. You're doing well. All is well, you know, and you'll come out right. You wait till the judgment seat of Christ. I'll tell you something else. God wants you to dedicate. He wants you to dedicate your family. God wants you to dedicate your family. God wants you to say, Lord, I, you know what Joshua said? He said, it's for me and my house. We will serve who? The Lord. Oh, Joshua opened his yap, opened that mouth, and stuck his foot, both of them in there, brother, just stuck them both in there and said, we're going to serve God. Have you ever done that? Have you ever just said, God, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Just do it. That's what God wants. God wants your flesh. God wants your family. You husbands, you listen to me. God doesn't want any less than your family. He doesn't, he doesn't want just you, Brother Roger. He doesn't want just uh, your wife. He wants those children. He wants the whole family. As for me and my house, Joshua said, we, not just the man, not just the man and the woman, we will serve the Lord. Folks, God's not going to be satisfied with any less. 
Don't think that he is because he's not. And you can't buy him off with tithes. You can't buy him off with a little time. You can't buy him off with a little talent. Some of you say, oh, Lord, I, I'll sing for you. Jesus, lover of my soul. You know, they sing, you know, and then, then, then the rest of the week they go out and live like they want to live. There's singers all over America doing that business. That's not acceptable. God isn't pleased with that. God is not going to be pleased with you and I until he gets the whole shoot match, the whole ball of wax. Lock, stock, and barrel. That's the issue. Why? What do you think God would have done if Solomon got up there and said, Well, Lord, now, uh, you can have the, uh, the most holy place. Now, we're going to use the holy place for a, a, a place where we're going to have a card game occasionally, uh, have a little bowling, uh, tennis, and things like that, a little golf. And uh, we'll, we'll use the holy place and we'll use the courtyard. But now you can have all, you can have the, well, that's what we do. Amen? That's what we do. We give God one little corner, see, and the rest of it we keep to ourselves. Keep to ourselves. Now that, God wants your fellowship. You know what your fellowship is? It's this work right here. Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. This is a bunch of fellows in the same ship. You have a captain, the head of the ship, and you have members of the ship. We're all trying to get this church to do what, listen, you know what, God, you know what God's building in this age? A church. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He isn't building businesses. He isn't building nations. He isn't building kingdoms. He's building a church. Are you? You helping? You pulling your weight? Did you ever play tug of war? Get about five or six people on one side of a rope and five or six other people and, and, and get a creek right in between you. That's the way to do it. Or get a, you know, get a creek or a river bed or something like that right in between you and whoever loses, man, goes in. That's the way to do it. Or a big mud hole. Just pull them right on through the mud. And you ever get on there, you know, and everybody's going like this and all of a sudden one guy just drops out and says, man, I've had it. I can't stand it anymore. It's too much for me. I'm going to take off. I'll tell you, you'll miss him. Every person that forsakes the assembling together of the saints, it hurts everybody else. I know what you think. You think, well, if I don't come, they won't miss me. You're wrong. You're wrong. You influence the people around you. You know what God wants? God only wants your flesh and your family. He wants this fellowship dedicated. He wants this church. You know how he wants it? He wants it filled with the Spirit of God. He wants it consecrated to him. Folks, God is our witness. We're not going to use anything that would bring glory to the world in the working of this church. If we ever do, it's going the wrong direction. It's no longer devoted to him. It'll be devoted to something else. And he wants it sanctified, set apart for his use. He, listen, folks, it pleases God to have all these preachers come in here and just preach and 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 preach. And, preach. and I'll tell you what we could do. could get Bozo the Clown and uh, the Talking Horse. Couldn't we? Amen. Have some guy parachute out of heaven or out of the sky, you know, and come out here, drop down here in the lot. We'd get us a crowd, wouldn't we? Sure we would. Why? So wouldn't St. Luke's. So wouldn't Dunnigan's. Oh, if Dunnigan's had a guy drop out of a drop out of an airplane and drop into his parking lot, he'd have a crowd down there. I don't believe that'll be the way we get a crowd. If preaching won't bring them, nothing else we can do can. God chose. He chose. He chose, not me. God chose the foolishness of preaching to save those who are lost. This church ought to be dedicated to God to do it God's way and God's will, God's work by God's word and no other way. That's what God's looking for, folks. He's not only looking for the prayer of salvation, he's looking for the prayer of dedication. Have you dedicated your flesh to God? Demas almost did. He almost did. But he decided he liked some things about the world too, so he kind of split his allegiance. And the Bible said he forsook Paul. That hurt Paul. He forsook me, having loved 
this present world. God wants your family. You better give it to him. You say, preacher, what will happen if I don't? The devil will get it. Go back there and read the story of Eli. Who was it? Was it you, George, or was it Brother Dick that brought in the illustration of Eli and the wicked sons? Was it you last Sunday night? Brother Dick. You ought to go back there and read that. Eli was a dedicated man. Eli was a faithful man in some things. But he hadn't restrained his sons. He said, as for me, I'll serve the Lord. But he never said, as for me and my family. He didn't dedicate his family to the Lord. He lost his family. You want to look at another one? How about Lot? He didn't even dedicate his flesh. And because he didn't dedicate himself, he never dedicated his family. He lost it all. He lost it all. You know, people say, why do you have to holler? Because if I stood up here and just said this in a monotone, you wouldn't listen to me. You'd all be asleep. Amen? Amen. Folks, uh, listen, if I'm not talking about the realities and the priorities of this life, let's go to the Ponderosa. Amen? Well, I mean, if, it's, if, if what I'm talking about is just, yeah, well, that's his opinion. Let's just go to the Ponderosa and we'll talk our opinions over our steak. Do you know why God wants it just like this? Because I can stand up and look you right square in the face and I can tell it to you and you can't talk back to me. Amen, Brother George? Amen. God likes it that way, brother. He likes me to get up here and just tell it to you just like this, just like that, and you've got to take it and you can't do anything about it. That's the way God likes it. I mean, if it's your opinion against mine, let's go to Ponderosa and we'll eat a steak and discuss opinions. We're not discussing opinions. What I'm telling you is the God's truth. Amen. The first thing God wants to hear out of any, the, any man, woman, or child in this life is the prayer of salvation. He isn't interested in anything else. And then once he gets that, he's interested in the prayer of dedication. And folks, he's not interested in anything else. He's not interested in whether your kids go to a Christian school. He's not interested in whether you make any money or not. You know what he's interested in? Are you going to dedicate yourselves to him? Now, once you get over that hump, then the Christian school and the jobs and all that other stuff will come in line. You know what God said? God said, I didn't say it. God said, Matthew 6, 33, he said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. He is righteousness. Then all these things shall be added unto you. He wants your flesh. He wants your family. He wants your fellowship. Last of all, Luke chapter 16. And I suppose this is the saddest prayer in the Bible. This is the prayer of damnation. The prayer of damnation. If you're here this morning and you're not saved, you may do a little praying in this life, and your prayers may never amount to much or avail much if you're not saved. One of these days, you'll really begin to pray. And it'll be too late then. In Luke chapter 16, you have the familiar story of the rich man in hell. The rich man in hell. In Luke chapter 16, it says there was a certain rich man, verse 19, which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. Health, wealth, and prosperity. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Now look at the condition of the one that was saved. He didn't have anything in this life. Did you see something there? Don't you see something there? God's not interested in whether it has a house to go to, whether it has a car to drive around in, or whether it has any clothes on. That's not what God's interested in. Jesus Christ said, he said, uh, don't concern yourself with the things of this life. He said, they'll take care of themselves. He said, sufficient, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. I mean, man, tomorrow is going to be evil. The next day is going to be evil. What are you worried about tomorrow for? It's going to be just as evil as today. He said, take no thought of what you eat or what you wear. That isn't the most important thing in life, folks. The most important thing of life is, are you saved? Are you dedicated? That's all God's interested in. God is not interested in, in the Super Bowl. God... But, uh, brother, he's not interested in, in whether you're a dentist. He doesn't care. He doesn't care whether you belong to the United States Air Force or the Russian Air Force. He doesn't. There are Christians in Russia. There are Christians under the persecution of Rome. He doesn't care if we live in a free land or an oppressed land. 
Don't you see what God's interested in? He's interested in you. What will you do with him? Amen. That's what he's interested in, folks. And that's it. That's the bottom line. We think God's interested in all this peripheral stuff. <laughs> he just uses all that to deal with you on the major issues. Are you saved? Have you dedicated your flesh, your family, and your fellowship to him? If not, then God is going to be on your doorstep day and night until it takes place. He's not going to quit until he gets his way. The prayer of damnation. It said he died. In verse 23, In hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. For I, and he said, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. The prayer of damnation. It's a prayer of severity. Severity. Pain. Hell is a place of pain. Hell is a place of torment. If you die unsaved, you'll go to hell. You'll be in torment. I didn't say that. Jesus Christ, God Almighty in the flesh, said it. He said he died, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. Hell is a place of conscious torment. Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14 says, The smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Hell is a place of conscious torment. And this man was sending up a prayer of severity. This prayer of damnation was severe. He was in trouble, and he was hurting. It's a place, the Bible says, of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. I guarantee, you know, sometimes we get down and pray and say, well, God, bless the missionaries, uh, save so-and-so, save Alan Parsons, and, uh, and, and, and say, there's no sincerity in it. No sincerity in it. Because there's no real loss to us. I mean, you know, well, we praise God they get saved. Well, if they don't, well, all things work together. Sometimes we just, we, just, we just justify everything just because we don't have the concern. This man's concern. Obviously, he's concerned. For the first time in his life, times are rough. A prayer of severity. If you die, my friend, and you go to hell, I guarantee you, your prayers will be severe then. And it was a prayer of sincerity. Look in verse 24. Have mercy on me. You better get sincere now. You better realize the severity of your soul and, and its relationship to God now. It won't do any good when you get in hell. You know what Abraham said on both issues? He said, I can't help you. He said, Abraham, have mercy on me. I'm tormented. Abraham said, sorry, you can't get out. Oh, he said, Father Abraham, send somebody to tell my brethren. He was sincere in his wish to help them to keep them out of hell. Abraham said, if one go to them from the grave, they won't hear. He never got his prayers answered. Never got his prayers answered. Saddest prayer in the Bible is the prayer of damnation. He's damned, 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 and he can't get out. There is no way out. There is no help for his brethren. There is no water in hell. There is no peace in hell. He's damned. And through the uh, ages, it'll ring out through the eternity and through ages, damned, damned, damned. And he'll never get out. He'll never get out. My friend, if you're in here this morning, that's the one prayer you don't want to pray. God wants you to repent. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants you to be saved and born again. God wants you to start where everybody else starts with the prayer of salvation. Will you be saved this morning? 
Will you confess your sin? Will you concede your need for Jesus Christ? And if you're saved, how about that dedication? That's the next step. God hasn't forgot about you and just continue to deal only with sinners. God's interested in the saints. God's interested in the saints. There's more of that Bible written to believers than there are to unbelievers. God's more interested in you than he is the unbeliever in that respect. He deals more with you and his people. You bear his name. You speak for him. You stand in his place. And he is concerned about you. Are you concerned about you? Have you prayed those prayer of dedication? Have you said, God, whatever I've got, it's yours. Time, tithe, talent, it's all yours. Anytime you want it. Anytime you need it. Anytime I need it. It's yours. I hope no one in here ever prays the last one, the prayer of damnation. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I believe what I've said here this morning are the real priorities of life that men ought always to pray. Prayer is, Father, drawing nigh to Thee on Thy terms. Lord, we are a needy people. There are folks in here, Father, this morning. I'm sure in a crowd this size, even though I don't see anybody I don't know, Father, I, I know there's somebody here lost this morning. God, you don't lay it on my heart to preach a message like this with somebody not being in here unsaved. Lord, there's somebody here this morning that's lost. Somebody here this morning, if they died this afternoon in an automobile accident, there's somebody here, Father, that split hell wide open. And there's no doubt about it. And they'd wind up just like the rich man in torment, weeping and wailing, and tormented forever in the presence of the holy angels, and they would be hollering out and crying out just like the rich man, but it would do them no good. Lord, 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 help them to see, like the thief on the cross, the need to repent and to trust Christ. And God, there are Christians in here this morning that have held back on you, that have bargained with you, dickered with you, and they've never come clean with you. They've never come all the way. They've just went half the way or part way. I pray you deal with each of us on the areas that we have not surrendered to thee. Lord, I'm sure there are some men here that you've laid their hands on for the ministry and they haven't yielded. I'm sure, Father, there's some ladies here and some men here you've laid your hand on them and encouraged them to be at visitation and they haven't yielded. And, Father, there are those of us, God, that you've burdened about praying more and being more sincere in our prayer life and uh, more honest in our prayer life, and we haven't, Father, we haven't conceded. God, help us to do that this morning. Help us to repent of our evil, wicked ways, our rebellious ways of rejecting Thee. God, I pray nobody leave here this morning and die and go to hell and pray the prayer of damnation. Lord, save sinners this morning. And, Lord, I pray that saints would dedicate it all. Like old Solomon did, he dedicated the whole thing. He acknowledged the omniscience and the omnipresence of God in that prayer. And, Lord, I pray that we'll acknowledge your power in our lives, your presence in our lives, and we give it all to thee. We lay it all on the altar this morning. I ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Let's all stand.